In recent years, and particularly recently, as China's economic growth has slowed down, there has been a fervent discussion about whether China will follow in Japan's footsteps in terms of its economic trajectory. As the world's second largest economy, China has experienced significant growth over the years. But questions remain about its ability to sustain this momentum. Drawing insights from the economic slowdown and debt cycle in China, as well as Japan's historical experience. If the spirits be uprising and indomitable, China has a very good chance of surpassing the United States. If the spirits be deflated and distressed, China will be no better than Japan after 1990, a country that desires nothing and aspires for nothing. China's Economic Challenges China's optimization of COVID policies helped the economy rebound in the first quarter. But challenges in the second quarter raised worries about a potential slippery slope akin to Japan's experience. Lessons from Japan's Economic Recession The Rise and Fall of Japan's Economy The 1980s witnessed Japan's remarkable economic boom, with its companies dominating global markets and even challenging the United States. However, Japan's decline after 1990, characterized by a significant contraction in various industries, raises concerns about the long-term sustainability of economic success. Unequal Trade Agreements The author explores how unequal trade agreements, such as those between Japan and the United States, limited Japan's ability to surpass its American counterpart. This raises questions about China's own economic ambitions and its relationship with the United States. Ambition and Growth the article examines the role of ambition in a country's development, considering the aspirations of the government, enterprises, and individuals. Industry Comparisons The article also highlights the gaps between China's leading companies and Japan's giants during the 1980s and 1990s across various sectors, such as automotive, consumer electronics, beauty, and semiconductors. These gaps represent areas of future growth for China. Balancing Ambition and Egalitarianism Maintaining a positive and upward spirit requires finding a balance between allowing companies to thrive and ensuring social mobility for individuals. China's Unique Path Unlike previous competitors like the Soviet Union and Japan, the author concludes that China is determined not to yield to the United States. While challenges lie ahead, China's unwavering ambition and refusal to succumb to external pressures set it apart, suggesting a different trajectory from that of Japan. In the 1980s and 90s, Japan was booming in top gear in a way that no other country has ever seen. Japan became an economic superpower as Japanese enterprises took over the global market. In 1989, the publication of That Japan Can Say No by Akio Morita and Shintaro Ishihara was an epitome of ballooning confidence that Japan can now stand up against the United States. The War of Chips by Yu Sheng, which I've been reading, also mentioned Japan in the good old times. In just 10 years, 1976-1985, Japan changed itself from the importer of one-third of U.S. semiconductors into an even larger producer than the United States. In March 1976, the Japanese government established the VLSI program. And in 10 years, it became number one in the world's semiconductor industry. After 1990, Japan's industries came crumbling down. The Japanese semiconductor sector fell from 50% to less than 20% of the market share. Shipbuilding, too, fell from 50% to less than 20%. The consumer electronics sector had a total collapse. The automobile industry managed just to maintain the market share, though. In 2000, there was not one Japanese company in the world's top 10 companies by market cap. After 1990, the spirits of the entire Japanese country, from the government to the enterprises and to the people, suddenly fell to the bottom. No investment, no entrepreneurship, no expansion the whole people went into goblin mode. The burst of Japan's bubble economy surely is a principal cause of the major societal shift. But other countries that also experienced bubble economy can manage to get back on their feet. Ku attributed this to a balance sheet recession. I believe that balance sheet recession is the consequence, not the cause. Richard Ku believes that this recession could be avoided if a proactive fiscal policy was adopted. I beg to differ. In order to stimulate the economy, the Japanese government has used monetary and fiscal policies to the extreme. The case is clear with monetary policies. Japan has maintained a long-term zero interest rate policy and is also the originator of quantitative easing. 
Richard Ku believes that the Japanese government's fiscal policy is not strong enough. But since 1990, Japan's government debt to GDP ratio has skyrocketed from a relatively healthy 60-70% to an unprecedented 264%. Extreme fiscal policies were not the cure to Japan's economic recession. What else can be done? A 500% debt to GDP ratio? The truth is, the Japanese government had used every trick up their sleeves. And the recession still caught up with them. At that time, Japan, on the one hand, felt oppressed by the United States and believed that no matter how hard it tried, it was impossible to surpass the United States and become the number one. On the other hand, Japan felt it had done quite well already, with its economy stably ranking as the second largest in the world. It seemed to make no difference whether Japan strives or not, so its ambitions finally faded away. So, where does China stand now? Honestly speaking, although China's GDP, calculated by exchange rates, has reached about 70% of the United States. Surpassing Japan's level in terms of scale, the overall position of China's leading companies in various industries globally is still not as good as Japan's between the 1980s and 1990s. In the automotive industry, China does not have any companies that can compare with Japan's Toyota. With the trend of new energy, BYD has a good chance of becoming China's Toyota. However, there is still a considerable gap between today's BYD and the Toyota of the 1980s and 1990s. In the consumer electronics industry, I am skeptical whether Huawei, the most advanced Chinese company, has surpassed Sony of Japan at the height of its prime. In the beauty industry, China still does not have any companies that can rival Shiseido of Japan. Japan is relatively weak in the pharmaceutical industry, not one Japanese company ranks among the top 10 global pharmaceutical companies. Takeda Pharmaceutical, the largest pharmaceutical company in Japan, should rank 12th with a revenue scale of 30 billion US dollars. In the semiconductor industry, Japan once held a 50% global market share in the 1980s and 1990s. The Chinese mainland today is definitely far behind. We need to acknowledge the gap, because there lies China's future growth. China currently produces the largest amount of physical goods in many categories globally. Yet when calculated per capita, not only is China's production power inferior to the United States, it also falls short of Japan. Taking the automotive industry as an example, Japan, with a population of 126 million, sells over 4 million cars annually, so that makes 3 3.5 cars sold per 100 people. In China, 23 million cars are sold annually, with less than 2 cars sold per 100 people. Even using Japan, a country with a large population but limited land, as a benchmark, China's automotive sales still have the potential to double. It is not easy for a country to maintain a positive and upward ambition continuously. For enterprises, an ambitious and upbeat spirit cannot be maintained when you set a development ceiling over their heads. In 1990, Japanese entrepreneurs realized that the United States was an unbreakable ceiling for Japan, and they lost their spirit. Today's Chinese entrepreneurs do not necessarily see the United States as a ceiling, but in some industries, such as the internet industry. Some entrepreneurs may feel that they have encountered some limits, and they are uncertain where the boundary lies between unregulated and orderly expansion. If entrepreneurs believe that they will hit a ceiling when their business expands, their ambition will diminish. We must ensure that mainstream entrepreneurs do not feel an invisible ceiling above them. Fortunately, not all industries in China currently have an invisible ceiling. The internet industry is an exception because of its deep association with ideology. Companies like BYD and Huawei do not feel an invisible ceiling above them. Maintaining the positive spirit of the people and maintaining that of enterprises are contradictory in a sense. If companies are allowed to monopolize indefinitely and expand disorderly, it becomes challenging for ordinary people to maintain their fighting spirit. On the other hand, if an egalitarian approach is adopted, it becomes difficult for enterprises to maintain their ambition. Ultimately, a balance needs to be struck. It is not easy to keep this balance. But no matter what, as long as China maintains a positive and upward spirit, strives for the top, and never gives up, it will not go down the same slippery slope as Japan. Although both the Soviet Union and Japan yielded to the United States by choice in their former competition, whatever the outcome, this time China will not give in.